Hey, it's your internet grandpa here. We're going to continue to read uh, Carry On Mr. Bowditch. We're in chapter 18. This is going to be chapter 18, part 2. And remember, uh, Nate was, uh, I think he was sleeping, and he heard all hands on deck, and then he realized that uh, he'd been hearing the boom of cannon in the distance. And he got to the deck, and the Estrella was alive with action, men running to secure battle lanterns. And then, uh, then a boat approached with a British officer. He was smiling, too excited to talk. Nelson has trounced Napoleon's fleet at the mouth of the Nile. We've got him now bottled up in Africa. And so it was a celebration. Tom Owens growled, secure your guns. Nate smiled at the words. Tom sounded as disgusted as Lem Harvey would have been. The Englishman said again, bottled up in Africa, no more trouble with Napoleon, I hope. Um, the Napoleonic Wars were, were world wars as far as uh, the Europeans were concerned. Um, we got drug into part of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the War of 1812 was really part of Britain's Napoleonic War with France. And uh, so, you know, this was, uh, this, this time Nate grew up, you know, it was, uh, before he was born, there was the French-Indian War, and then, uh, the revolution and the war of 1812 and then the rest of the Napoleonic Wars, it, all that was going on. So he lived in a very tumultuous time. So anyway, on with the story. What about the French privateers in the Mediterranean, Prince asked. We're standing out of Cadiz for Alcante soon. Into the Mediterranean? You'd be safer in convoy with our fleet. So the Estrella, with some 400 other vessels, started in a vast convoy guarded by British warships. It was not long before the lookout on the Estrella saw three small vessels dropping astern. 400 ships, can you imagine how long it would take them to form up and form a convoy and start sailing? Man, that'd take some time, I imagine. Collins leveled his glass. The lagging vessels were American. What, the f what are the fools up to, he muttered. Prince studied them too. They're heavy laden to keep up. They're too heavy laden to keep up. Scuppers under the lot of them. Serve him right if. Then he said, bring her about, Mr. Collins. Aye, aye, sir. There was no hesitation from the first mate or from any of the crew as they fell to a will to bring the Estrella about. They left the protection of the convoy and headed back toward the floundering little vessels. When the Estrella was close enough to speak to the ships, Captain Prince hailed them. The Estrella, he told them, had 19 guns and a crew that could use them. Cheers rose from the little ships. Tom Owen swaggered and grinned. One man convoy. That's what we are. Nate smiled to himself. Lem Harvey wasn't the only man born for a fight. So remember what the name of this chapter was? The Estrella to the Rescue. So now we see what the rescue is. These three ships couldn't keep up with the convoy, so the Estrella was going to be the military convoy. Hmm. Suppose we'll have a fight with pirates? All good stories have pirates, you know. For two days, the Estrella trimmed sail to the speed of the floundering vessels. Tom began muttering under his breath. What was the use, he wanted to know, wallowing along with fools who didn't know how to sail. They couldn't make six knots in a trade wind, he grumbled. They don't deserve the lookout sing song. Sail ho! Froze every man in his tracks. Then with a glad bellow, Tom leaped for the guns. Captain Prince came on deck and leveled his glass. Three of them, he said, and flying French colors. There was no doubt about the colors or the intention of the three ships. They were altering their course, bearing straight down on the Estrella. When the decks were cleared, the guns bowsed out. Prince, and went, Prince went below with Nate. Prince opened the logbook and picked up a quill. Better note this now, he said dryly. Maybe a little rushed later. He made the entry and dusted the ink with sand. We'll need someone in the powder room when things start, he said. Nate sat down and puffed, pulled off his shoes. He knew the danger of a scuffed nail strike, striking a spark and setting off the powder. I can take care of the powder room. So Nate was worried about the nails in his shoes striking something metal on the floor, like a nail in the board or something, causing a spark and setting off the powder room. What a time, huh? What a time. Prince frowned and started to speak. Then he shrugged. Why not? I was going to say we can't risk having our navigator blown to bits. 
You know, if the powder room gets a direct hit, it goes. But if the powder room's blown to bits, the Estrella won't need a navigator, will she? Carry on, Mr. Bowditch. He went topside. Nate went to the powder room, blinking in the gloom. The only light there came from a small, round window into, into the next cabin. For a n moment, Nate was disappointed. He thought of getting a little work done while he waited. He'd forgotten they couldn't risk candles or lanterns near the kegs and bags of powder. Johnny was there sloshing down the floor with water. They say it helps some. Of course, if that tier of kegs got a direct hit, he shrugged and grinned. Good luck, Mr. Bowditch, sir. Nate's eyes grew accustomed to the dim glow. It really wasn't too dark, he decided, and no use just sitting there twiddling his thumbs till they needed him to hand up powder. He went to his cabin, got his slate and pencil. The next thing he heard was Prince's bellow. He started and jumped to his feet. Aye, aye, sir! You ready for powder? Prince said the Frenchies didn't like our guns. They got close enough for a good look, then crowded sail and cleared out. Tom's disgusted. Sorry I forgot about you and left you down there so long. Long? Great guns, man. You've been down you've been here three hours. You sure, sir? Prince broke out into a roar of laughter that brought Collins that brought Collins below. Prince told him the joke. I give up. I've been through a lot in my days, but I never heard saw of a man huddle on a powder keg and forget where he was for three hours. That's one for your letter to Elizabeth. Nate shook his head. No, sir. She might worry. Take my advice and tell her, Collins says. You're married a long time, you know, and women always hear everything sooner or later. If you skip anything, some kind friend is sure to say, did your husband ever tell you about the time? So you tell her first. That way, you want her the way you want her to hear it. Your husband, Nate smiled at the sound of that. He closed the powder room and dogged shut the door and went for his shoes. In his cabin, he returned to his work. Nothing for him to do now until Alicante. Alicante. They had been off Alicante about a week when a ship flying the American flag anchored near them, the Ember from Salem. Captain Gorman commanding. Nate hadn't recognized how glad he'd be to see someone from home until Captain Gorman came on board the Estrella. Captain Gorman did not seem half so glad to see Nate. He nodded abruptly and said, Captain Prince, I'd like to see you below. Nate felt his temper rising. He'd shrugged off his anger. Captain Gorman probably had something on his mind. He'd be in a better mood after he talked to Captain Prince. Charlie came to him, frowning with importance. The captain's compliments, Mr. Bowditch. He'll see you below. When Nate entered the cabin, Prince said, Sit down, Nate. Sit down, boy. This sounds like bad news coming. Just saying. Sit down, Nate. Sit down, boy. Captain Gorman sat with his head bowed, his elbows on his knees, staring at nothing. Prince strode up and down the cabin a few times. I'm, I'm not going to stand off on a, about this, Nate. Elizabeth, your wife is dead. Captain Gorman said, that's all I know, Mr. Bowditch. A ship passed me that had left Salem later than we had. They gave me the word. Nate didn't know when they went out. He realized finally he was alone in the captain, in the cabin, and the cabin was growing dark. Let me read that sentence again. He realized finally that he was alone in the cabin, and the cabin was growing dark. Boy, I still muffed it. Eight bells sounded. He offered to take the anchor watch. He went topside. Mr. Collins said, you've been relieved, Mr. Bowditch. Nate thanked him and went forward to the bow. For a long time, he stood there staring at the sky. The moon rose and made a glittering path on the water. Nate found himself staring into the water. How deep was it, he wondered. You ever see the glittering path that a sunset or a moon makes when it's close to the horizon? That path it makes on the water, that's really lovely. But he was thinking about not so lovely things. He was wondering how deep the water was. Charlie Waldo spoke at his elbow. Mr. Bowditch, sir. Nate stiffened. Yes, what is it? I need you, sir. Could you help me, please? This navigation, I'm trying to learn. Of course, Charlie. Come along to my cabin. For an hour, he worked with Charlie over the problem that had stumped him, explaining this way and that until the boy understood. I have it now, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie Waldo. You may not know, but you helped me too. He went topside again and found Mr. Collins. I'll stand the next anchor watch, he said. 
I don't seem particularly sleepy. Collins nodded. Right, Mr. Bowditch. He was silent for a moment, then he went on quietly. I remember when I lost my wife. Work helps. And that's the end of chapter 18. So that's all for now. Love you. Sorry, we have to end on such bad news for Nate. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.